Fillmore said, inspired passion is an inflow of divine ideas, activity of a spiritual character, an understanding that over time comes from inspiration and intuition. This acquired wisdom is the foundation of personal integrity, a quality of consciousness that allows one to embrace an unwavering conformity to a spiritual ideal, spiritual philosophy, and spiritual practice. What's interesting is Fillmore joins together the idea of inspired passion and unwavering conformity. Compassion and conformity. Let me tell you a Louis Gates story. What I think has to do with passion. Anyone who knew Louis knew that he had a passion for life, but he also had a passion for a wicked, wicked sense of humor. And I was just at a cinema this year, and I came in, and I sat next to he and Michael. And uh, there were some musical things going on in the main hall and everything. And then there was a speaker who came up, and as the speaker began to talk, it was just one of those really amazing, powerful, insightful kind of talks. And, you know, everyone was just kind of like, uh, you know, Asilomar is kind of high energy, but everyone was just taken back into this place of this really inspired place, this profound place. And so I had a, I had a tablet on my lap, and so the speaker was talking and I wanted to write down a note, so I reached in my pocket and I pulled out this pen. This pen that I carry, it's kind of my good luck charm. I've carried this pen around for a long time. So I pulled this pen out and I, and I opened it up and I was all ready to write. Louis, who's sitting next to me, turns to me and looks right into my face and those beautiful blue eyes of Louis. And he said, Andy, he said, you are a child of God. You are an empowered, you are just a wonderful child of God. And in no way, shape, or form should you ever feel inferior, no matter how small your instrument is. <laughs> that was Louis. And the thing about Louis that I want to go on is the second piece. That's the passion. The second piece, the unwavering conformity. I had a conversation with Louis. I'm sure there are a lot of people who knew Louis better than I do, but I did know him a little bit, and we had a conversation one day. And Louis was gay. He was a gay man. And if you spent two minutes with Louis, you knew it. And that's the way Louis was his entire life. I mean, Louis in, in, in high school was a cheerleader. <laughs> I mean, you know, he, I think he called him a yell leader, but there was a picture of him I saw one time. He went to Chico High, and because he's a local guy, and he went to Chico High, and he had the big C on his chest, and he was, you know, and his hair never changed. He had the same hairstyle throughout his whole life, and he was just so cute. And he showed, in fact, he showed me the picture of himself as a yell leader, and he said, Andy, wasn't I just adorable? <laughs> I said, yeah, I said, you were. And he said, you know, he said, I was Catholic and I was an altar boy. He said, you know, he said, there is a part of me that I don't know if I'll ever recover from. I am hurt so deeply. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, he said, you know, these priests we've gotten to know, they kind of fool around with altar boys. He said, I never got one. I was never approached one single time. <laughs> he said, and I was so adorable. Look at me there. He told me that during, I mean, Louis wasn't, you know, Louis was a yell leader, but he didn't know much about sports. And so he told me one time that he started to yell. He said, first and 10, let's do it again. First and 10, let's do it again. I said, well, that's great. What was wrong with that? He said, the other team had the ball. <laughs> <clears throat> Louis was probably all the cheerleader's best girlfriend. They talked to him about their boyfriends and all that stuff. But Louis told me that you know he grew up in a, he grew up in a farming family and his 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 last name Gates I think is German but he's very Italian his mom was Italian and so they were farmers his dad he said he told me he said my dad was very German my dad was a very hard worker very linear very myopic at times really hard working guy 
and his mom was Italian, and so they grew up, and they had orchards there in Chico. And can you imagine, I mean, this guy growing up in Chico, California, farming family, you know, and when was he going to school? What, the 40s and 50s, you know what I'm saying? Being who he is. And he told me one time, he said, um, he said, you know, he said, yeah, he says, I was given a hard time when I was a kid, you know? Because Louis was someone who had a passion for life. He had a passion for the better things of life. Um, he was effeminate. You know, it, it, he was just wonderful. He was, he, was, he was so loving and so wonderful. And um, he was gentle and he was kind. And um, he made a commitment early on to rise above life, pure and simple. Um, he grew up Catholic, but became involved in his first foray into metaphysics was in Christian science, the writings of Mary Baker Eddy and stuff, and he, he was involved in that, and he explored that. Louis' spiritual seeking was always around the idea of life being better, of life being more. And eventually, his, his, one of his dearest friends in the whole world, Dr. Carolyn McEwen, Reverend Carolyn, who founded the Chico Center, they hooked up at some point. I have no idea. I don't know the history. And Louis didn't see the world the same way again. He absolutely adored Carolyn as a minister. And he discovered what he, you know, he called this beloved teaching. And I heard him speak a few times. He was on some awards committees through CSL, and I heard him speak sometime giving some awards, and whenever he would quote Holmes, he'd say, our beloved Ernest, our beloved Ernest Holmes. Rod Loomis, who goes around singing in the area, in fact, he'll be here in a couple of weeks, Rod Loomis told me one time, he said, don't you think Louie kind of looks like Ernest Holmes? I said, yeah, it's really true, you know? And he had that gentleness, and, 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 and Louis saw metaphysics as a celebration of life. He saw metaphysics as something that could take us beyond where we were. He told me one time that, you know, Louis became a very successful businessman, he and Michael. And he became very successful in ministry. And it's funny because I think Louis was a guy whose passion took him into the teaching. And that's what, you know, this part of it where it says, the, the unwavering conformity. Louis was a metaphysician. He was a true believer. He was into science of mind. A lot of us who are in metaphysics and science of mind, we, we look into other areas of study. And Louis was very much science of mind. He was very much metaphysics. He was very much Holmes. And he, he saw it as a way to celebrate life. And so there were, once upon a time, there was a kid in Chico, California, who, who probably must have felt like the biggest fish out of water. And he decided to grab a hold of something more. So we had this conversation, and he was telling me that he was talking about growing up gay, and he was talking, he said, yeah, he said, the way he put it was, he says, I was given a hard time. And, he, and so he went to a high school reunion not too long ago. And I mean, he's been out of high school for a really long time. And there was a kid he had gone to high school with who, who Louis said he just uh, did unspeakable things to him. I have no idea. I mean, he didn't elaborate. You can only imagine. But Louis said, you know, the, the names he was called were just these horrendous names. All of the slurs that pe the gay people have endured and plus the four-letter words. So he was at the high school reunion, and the gentleman who now is, you know, however, whatever age he was, came up to Louis, and he hadn't been to a lot of reunions. And Louis is just going, oh, God, this is great. You know? I mean, Louis, who's probably wearing a $5,000 suit and Italian shoes and cufflinks and hair and everything, gentleman walks up to him, and he said, uh, the guy said, um, he said, you know, he said, you have really made something special of your life. And I really commend you for that. I commend you for your strength. I commend you for 
for your way of being in the world. And Louis just couldn't believe it. And Louis was, you know, and, and they were able to have a conversation about spirituality. Because a lot of what made Louis who he was, was his spirituality. It was his spiritual practice. You know, last week we talked about the East, and the East is that place where, you know, the, the star comes up, or that flash, or that, that something we've never seen before, and it catches our attention, and it catches our imagination. That's the East. I'm sorry, I think I said the South. That's the East. The South is where we settle into a passion. We settle into a passion. You know, one of my favorite movies, uh, Bridges of Madison County, uh, Francesca is talking to Kincaid, the photographer, and she, she's asking him about why he's a photographer. And he said, I have no idea. He said, you know, how, how can you talk about a passion? How can you talk about an obsession? He says, I just, I just do it because he had traveled the world around. He, he didn't have a marriage. He didn't have a relationship. He really didn't have a home. And she didn't understand that because he says, I follow my passion. I follow my obsession. That's what the southern region is all about. Think about the southern part of the United States, jazz and spirituality and the blues and the great cooking that comes out of the south and all these great things. My mom had a good friend. Her name was Dorothy. She was from the deep south. And when she talked about cooking this amazing food, I love going over there at Christmas time. I mean, I'm not kidding you. She was amazing. And she said, you know, honey, you just take the most wonderful things in the world and you put a little fire under them and spend some time. And oh, my God, it's just wonderful, isn't it? There isn't a single boy I've ever met who doesn't like my cooking. That was Dorothy. And boy, she was right. She made something called chocolate gravy that was not chocolate or gravy. I don't know what it was. But I was hoping that I would get it intravenously anyway. <laughs> so Louis's dad, who was a farmer, went out sometime in the late 40s and bought himself a Studebaker pickup. He brought it onto the farm, and that became the place where his dad, that became his office and his place of being. And that truck was all over that farm and all over that ranch and did everything. It hauled everything. It did everything. And over the years, it picked up the scars and the dirt and the dents and the rust that a, that a truck on the farm takes. His dad only owned one truck the whole time he had the farm. And when he was done with that truck, they said that where the, um, the liner in the cab had torn away, his dad had taken a pencil and had worked out mathematical equations and phone numbers up in the top of that cab with a pencil. They found all that. So, imagine a kid growing up in Chico, California, Catholic, mom who's Italian, father, a father who's German on a farm, a father who lived his life in overalls and an old dented truck, and this kid named Louis came along, this very, very special, sweet soul who came into this world. His father passed away, so Louis got, in, got a hold of that truck, and he took it into town, and he found the be very best people he could and had that truck completely restored. Today, it is absolutely gorgeous. It's what Michael refers to as Louis' sissy truck. <laughs> but I love this because this is Louis. You know, the oldest cliche in the world, you take lemons and you make lemonade. And Louis took that old truck and he, he honored his past, he honored that farm, he honored his father, but he said, I want to take it to another place. You know, <clears throat> Ernest Holmes got a lot of inspiration from artists. He said, when he talked about mysticism, he said, the artists are the best and the brightest and the most mystical among us. And he, he said that because artists are people who chase something. They dedicate their lives to it. Monet said that each and every morning he woke up and he chased the sunlight. 
But an artist never arrives. They are in process somewhere. They are doing their own thing. That's the passion. Their, their own thing is the passion. But the fact that they get up every morning is that part where, as Fillmore said, the unwavering conformity to something. Imagine the people that our world has seen who have had an unwavering conformity to something. They are the, the greatest among us. They're the Martin Luther Kings. They're the Lincolns. They're the Mother Teresas. They are the artists. They are the poets. They are the people who break away from families, break away from religions. They are people who, who grab a hold of something and dedicate their lives to it. And people come along and say, well, what's the end game here? And it's like, I really don't know what it is. I just know that I am part of something that is bigger and grander and better and more profound. And that was, that was Louis Gates. He woke, he woke up every morning as a metaphysician, period, plain and simple. He was a student of spirituality. He was a seeker. He brought it into his business life. He brought it into his relationships. He brought it into every aspect of himself. He was, in essence, ba basically, he was like an altar boy his whole life. He was into it. I want to bring your attention to something that our organization is into, if you want to put it that way. And you found it on your seat when you came in this morning. It's called CSL's Global Heart Vision. You and I are going to go through this in just a moment. But this, this Global Heart Vision is something that's been endorsed by our movement and as you go through this, you're probably going to say to yourself, wow, this is pretty lofty. This isn't the way the world looks today. But basically, as those of us who are willing to give ourselves over to the conformity of a higher ideal, we know, we know that this is where the world is going. So what I want to do is I want to go through this with you. And I'm going to start off, and you, you'll notice that some of the parts have that little curly QE thing there. That's an actual term, by the way. And I, I'm going to read that, and then you're going to read the next one, and it, it's over on the back as well, and then we're going to read the last one together, okay? So I'll start. The CSO Global Heart Vision. We envision the emergence of the global heart to balance and guide the future evolution of humanity as stewards of our planet and all its inhabitants. We see a world free of violence, war, hunger, separation, and We see a world in which there is generous and continuous sharing of heart and resources. We envision a world in which forgiveness, whether for errors, injustices, or debts, is the norm. We see a world in which borders are irrelevant. We see a world which has renewed its emphasis on beauty, nature, and love through the resurgence of creativity, art, and aesthetics. We see a world in which love and we envision a world in which we live and grow as one global family that respects and honors the interconnectedness of all life. We envision centers for spiritual living standing firmly on and in these high ideals, these high truths in all that we do, say, envision, demonstrate, emulate, and teach. Our spiritual leader, a gentleman by the name of Ken Gordon, is very passionate about the global heart vision. 
And some years ago, when he became involved as our spiritual leader, this is something he brought forward. In other words, he said, it is time for our teaching to move beyond us as individuals and to move into the world, and to move into the world through us. Again, these are lofty ideals. As you read them, you can probably imagine that, you know, this isn't what the world looks like today, but it's this idea of a passion. It's this idea of how can we give ourselves over. In a, a disciplined kind of way, that last piece where we... We, we, we are willing to take this on in terms of what we say and do and teach and conduct our business in this way. In order to basically to give ourselves over to an ideal, the way that Louis Gates did. And Ken Gordon feels very strongly about this ideal. He feels so strongly about it, in fact, that he wrote a letter to someone who's one of our congregants. And I want to read it to you today, but I want to ask Sheila to come up here first. Okay. <laughs> Sheila doesn't know this, but Ken Gordon wrote her a letter. And this is what he said. Dear Sheila, on behalf of the entire religious science movement, I am pleased to recognize you as an emeritus practitioner <laughs> and congratulations on this very special day of honor. Someone with your distinguished record of service is indeed the model for all professional practitioners to emulate. You are an inspiration and an example of the global heart in action. So what I know about Sheila, I'm not, I'm not going to let her go anywhere, okay. but I have a cold so we can't get too close. What I know about Sheila is that the things that I said about Louie are true of her as well. Sheila, go ahead. <laughs> Sheila embodies this teaching, and I know that when she wakes up every morning, she is first and foremost a metaphysician. She is a spiritual seeker. And I know that Sheila is also involved in this teaching the same way that Louis is, because Louis is still with us, of making life better. That each and every day is a chance to move into a larger expression of ourselves and for each and every one of you. And I know that as a minister here, you know, still a relatively young minister, her presence and her, her teaching and, and, and have been so powerful to me that she simply lives in principle. And she is simply a, a gift to this entire movement. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this from her and give it to Tom, and she's going to come over and be the practitioner of the day. <laughs>